Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Who knew that the move you'd pull on the uh, on the ODR with your buddies as they're going down on a breakaway at the end of your session, like the sun's going down, it's getting a little too cold, your toes are numb, and you're like, ah, I'm not letting him score, and you just chuck your stick to ruin the breakaway? Who knew that was legal in the NHL? What an amazing turn of events. I think more players should do this. I used to throw a chest up. Yeah, con- not along the ice. Oh, okay. It was a concussion hazard for sure. Oh, and with the bumpy ice too and everything? If you were throwing them at your buddy's feet, you're way too nice to your buddy. <laughs> Knees, <laughs> hips, shoulders. We're not aiming for the head, but we don't have great aim, so things happen. Really, Schwartz was pretty you know, classy with how he did it, just sliding it along Very the ice. Very gentlemanly. Yeah, it was. That was, it was so bad, it was funny. Like, the immediate, there's no way they missed something that bad. And then you went back and saw the replay, you're like, that was so terrible that, of course, you're pissed off because it turned into a goal and it ultimately, I think, had a big part in ruining the Red Wings game. But that was, it, it, like, it, it just stepped into the territory of you have to laugh at this right away. I'm much more happy that we review skates to see if they're an inch or a pixel offside <laughs> than if someone hurls their stick at a at a puck to break up a play. What I, I, let's keep it as is. We don't need to rewrite the rule book. Just keep it as is. What I've learned is if you're allowed to throw your stick, going back to mine and Evan's philosophy in pond hockey, don't half-ass it. I, I feel like Jaden Schwartz didn't go far enough, and the Red Wings— in retaliation, when Ty Karche had that breakaway, Oli Mata should have thrown that spear like he was in 300. <laughs> Just to see if he would bleed. <laughs> like, well, you didn't call it earlier, so you've really set precedence on this. You worked so hard to come at the games from an analytical, objective approach, and then I'm like, oh, well, Dylan Larkin shouldn't have hooked the guy. He should have just chucked his stick. He said, yep. oops. Yeah. Anyways, that was funny. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, folks. Full roster today, here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and lots more. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be talking about an eventful game at the LCA that Detroit had against the Seattle Kraken, ultimately ending in an overtime loss, which was disappointing for multiple reasons, but a mixed bag of a game for Detroit, which we'll get into We'll have an argument, and it will be an argument, because we almost started arguing about this in my kitchen, about our proposed rules for the how to fix three-on-three overtime, and then I stopped myself and said, Brad, let's argue about this on air, and I think Evan's going to come in and throw a you know, a grenade in that one, too, so that should be fun. Uh, we'll talk about Detroit's upcoming games, some minor injury news and health updates, an interesting article that Max Boltman, good friend of the show, wrote uh, about the Red Wings and their winning and how they're handling things, and then some big NHL news, some that just dropped right actually as we were prepping to record, which was the NHL has voted to decentralize the draft after all. The details are still being figured out, but we're going to jump into what that means for the draft moving forward and lots more before overtime. Before all that, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is we have sold out of the 400 tickets that come with the Winged Wheel podcast and Detroit Red Wings co-branded beanie for Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA on Saturday, November 4th. The good news is we worked with our friends at the Detroit Red Wings to secure 100 more tickets, and that is it. That is much as we can do is 100 more tickets and hats for you to buy. I think one of them has already sold, so someone got wise to the fact. But there are 99 at most tickets remaining to Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA that come with the Detroit Red Wings and Winged Wheel Podcast co-branded beanie. What Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA is, is a... <clears throat> in the butt? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, were you having your little uh, inner little John moment there? <laughs> <clears throat> what Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA is, is a partnered event between us and the Detroit Red Wings where we host a live episode of the show at Little Caesars Arena before a Red Wings game. So when you buy a ticket, you not only get access to that live episode, you also, of course, get a ticket to the game where you sit in Winged Wheel Podcast-specific seating sections. The gondola, which is the view that Ken and Mick call the games from, is already full and sold out, but there are upper and lower bowl tickets still available. You'll be sitting with other Winged Wheel Podcast listeners. You'll obviously, of course, before the game, get access to that live show where you'll get your beanie. 
a officially licensed Red Wings and Wind Wheel podcast uh, co-branded beanie. You'll have uh, other merch, prizes, giveaways, things like that at the event, and there will be food and drink available. The episode itself is fun because it not only will have us, the hosts, who you can meet and greet thereafter, but Ken Daniels and Chris Osgood will be joining us as special guests for this one. So Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA, Saturday, November 4th. Tickets are finite. Wingedwheelpodcast.com slash Red Wings or go to the link in the description to get your tickets. They are discounted, so cheaper than regular tickets, and a portion of the proceeds benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation, which is the most important part of all. So again, wingedwheelpodcast.com slash Red Wings or go to the link in the description. So Detroit has points in six straight, which is a really, really good thing. Since their opening night loss against New Jersey, they have not failed to secure at least one point. Actually, the OT loss was the first time they didn't s- score two points since the start of the season. It doesn't change the fact that after five straight wins and seeing that the Red Wings are indeed a better team, it is a little bit disappointing, and you kind of have to check yourself because obviously the winning streak wasn't going to last forever, but it, it was a little bit disappointing that they didn't get the win because they were so close. They were like one inch further right on a Lucas Raymond shot away from walking away with two points again. Well, you can't win them all. That's the old saying. The difference between this and previous years is this was an exciting glimpse into, I'm going to call it a pretty dramatic shift in how games like this go for the Red Wings because they weren't at their best. No. They didn't have a strong game, especially in the first two periods. Seattle outplayed them for the most part. But for the first time in I don't know how long, the Red Wings out outskilled their opponent into stealing a point that they didn't deserve. Yeah. That their talent took over in the third period. You know, the Larkins, the DeBrinkets, the Gosses Bears, the supremely talented players were just better than the Seattle penalty killers. And they were able to claw back and get a point in a game where they probably shouldn't have got a point. Yeah, and before, when the Red Wings had a bad game, the storyline, as you were alluding to, Brad, was, well, then they lose. Or maybe on some miracle, it's a stingy game and they win by a goal, or, you know, Huso or Bernier way back in the, in the day would save them and whatever it was. But now, it is way more plausible that the Red Wings can have an off night and still rely on one of a couple facets of their game that is much improved, and this time the power play, to save them. It's not... It's not a miracle like it was in the past. This is how good teams salvage points over the course of a season. 82-game season is very long. You're not going to win all of them. You're not going to be on your best you know, game for all of them. So you have to do what you can do to salvage and steal those points when you can. So is it a good result for the Red Wings? I think on balance, yeah. You, you of course, don't want to be losing in overtime, and you want to have better games than Detroit played, but this is just the reality of the course of the season. So all in all, we'll, we'll break down the specifics of it, but yeah, I think this is... A good result for that game, and I agree with you, Brad. It's a good sign for the team in the season overall. Well, if you go back through any point in the rebuild, and I say the goalie gives up five, the defense is suspect, and the forwards really aren't clicking, your question would be, do they lose by four or five? Yeah. At what point did people start to tune out of the game as opposed to the LCA, which on a random you know, Tuesday night was absolutely rocking? That's one of my biggest takeaways from just the start of this season, even compared to last season, the the will to sort of stay in the game and not just, you know, sell everything when when you're down 4-1 or 3-1. That this team has an inner belief that they can start to come back in games, and we've seen that this year. Um, we saw that in New Jersey, and we saw that last night. So the ultimate score ended up being 5-4 for Seattle in overtime. Scoring was opened by Joe Valeno, who got his fourth of the year, continues to produce. So that is a, you know, to a lot of people, a secondary storyline, but a really important one that his kind of depth production is continuing. So good on Joe Valeno for making the most of those opportunities. And we said it before, but Joe Valeno's goals and his production that you expect from him isn't going to be at a you know goal per game pace or anything like that. And they're not going to all be the most highlight real goals in the world. But those tip in goals, those kind of grindy around the net goals that's how you need him to produce in a depth manner so he tipped in that Mata point shot sprung on the assist and then Seattle just took over Jaden Schwartz twice and then Ty Cartier off of a very controversial goal which we'll get into in a little bit here and then in the third period pissed off at the referee's mistake 
and you know looking to get back in the game quick. Shane Gosses Bear with a absolute missile. He stepped into that shot and it was unreal how quickly that thing went, you know, roof bar down. Shane Gosses Bear, I have so much time for. I could talk about him every episode for 30 minutes about how good he's been for Detroit. Uh, Sider and Larkin assisted there. Larkin then also on the power play. Really, really great move in front to to get it past Accord. Made it 3-3, tied the game. Gosses Bear got a point there. Sider factored in again. And then Alex Debrinkit made it 4-3 again on the power play from who else other than Larkin and Gosses Bear. And that was just, you were watching that happen and you're like, oh man, Detroit's going to do this again. They are going to win a game by virtue of their power play going, you know, very, very quickly striking three times. I think they went, what, three for six on the day, on the night. And so you actually believe that they were going to do it. Seattle got an unfortunate goal really late in the game. Larkin took a penalty, which was a hooking penalty, but it was still kind of, I don't know. The way penalties were being called that night, I was like, it, it made you angry based on the calls that Detroit received earlier. You thought you'd hope that they might have had a little bit of a break, but they didn't. Seattle scored, and then over time, it was a, a mixture of crazy back and forth and then frustrating uh, possession. And Lucas Raymond rang one off the bar. Seattle went down the other way, and then they ended up scoring. So 5-4, bummer of a loss, but Detroit did make it interesting there. Let's talk about the stick toss. And I don't want to spend, you know, the entire episode whining about the referees. We'll put it out all front. Like, they were terrible. They were terrible that game. I think they did influence the outcome of the game. That doesn't take over the fact that Detroit didn't really play well and Seattle did play better than them overall. But on the balance of the game, you look at how the score ended up and how Detroit came back. Yeah, they affected the game. A referee's blatant poor decision affected the outcome. And it stands to reason that Detroit might have walked away with two points. If not, I digress. A puck is coming across Seattle's crease, or just in front of the crease, through the slot. Who was it that was going for the one-timer? Was that Mata. Mata? It was going for a one-timer. It was a wide-open one-timer. Jaden Schwartz, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about this. Like He intentionally saw the trajectory of the puck, realized he wouldn't be able to reach it or splay out or anything, and like someone who's curling glides the rock out, just glided his stick out, threw his stick into the lane, interfered with the puck, and Mata didn't get the shot off. On a break that came shortly thereafter, going the other way, Ty Cartier scored, and instead of a 2-1 game for Seattle and Detroit has a power play, which they might have scored on or not, you never know, it was then 3-1 Seattle going into the second intermission. Well, throwing the stick, isn't that an automatic penalty shot? It's a good question, Brad. I was reading Scouting the Refs, and they cited Rule 53 throwing equipment, clearly indicates that what happened was not only against the rules, but deserving of a penalty shot. When any member of the defending team throws or shoots any part of a stick or any other object or piece of equipment at the puck or puck carrier in his defending zone, the referee or lines person shall allow the play to be completed, and if a goal is not scored, a penalty shot shall be awarded to the non-offending team. This shot shall be taken by the player designated by the referee as a player fouled. So really, there were all of the linesmen, and two referees whose job it is to call penalties watched Ole Mata get interfered with by Jane Schwartz throwing his stick, and he didn't get the penalty shot. And not only that, the worst possible outcome came afterwards, which was Seattle scoring. So I don't know how to state this more clearly. Like, there's no debate or discussion to be had here. Like, that was one of the most blatant non-calls I've ever seen. I'm just thankful it's happening now in the season and not like late in the season, let's say every game counts all the same and every goal counts all the same over the course of the year. But imagine this happened in like a playoff deciding game. My God, like that the is ref the referees robbed us of seeing Ole Mata pull off the Datsu. <laughs> <laughs> that is the reality I choose to live in a hundred percent. I don't know, man. I, I have a hard time sitting here and saying, yes, this team lost more because of the referees. And I think this this kind of thing happens, not the specific situation, but this kind of thing happens to every team over the course of a season. There's like a pretty blatant call or two that affects the game, but it doesn't make it any easier for fans, especially in a game like that where Detroit did ultimately show that they could come back and win. That was pretty terrible. I'll, I will say, I guarantee you, they were not even out of the arena before the referees received a call from the head ref. It was probably at intermission. <laughs> oh, my God. And Derek Lalonde said they apologized to him after second intermission. Like, they knew. 
they knew. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, I, he's a more patient man than me because he said like it was really classy, and he he has a lot of respect for them for doing that. <laughs> in the moment, I would have went nuclear. Oh yeah, nuclear. Worse than I was going nuclear in my car as I waited for that train to start moving again, trying again, to get here. That's your punishment. That's your punishment. Right. Did you try throwing a stick at it? <laughs> you know what? I didn't. But next time, I'll make sure I'll video it for science. That play. You know the 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 part that actually made me start laughing right away wasn't Mickey Redmond's reaction, which was hysterical. Which was Mickey Redmond. Some folks call him biased. He is actually incredibly objective. He'll call the Red Wings out when they take a penalty or he'll call the referees out when they call a penalty on the opposing team. That's a little chintzy, but his reaction was like, Oh my God, like not even close. But what started making me laugh more than anything was everyone saying is Brad seeing this. And he was, you just weren't, you know, responding to it in real time. And I I thought I, I'm not sure that his blood vessels aren't going to rupture watching this. Like I'm not the type Again, I, I understand how hard a referee's job is, and I try to be as fair as possible. You know, if there's a high stick behind the play and the refs miss it, I'm irritated, but whatever. I get it. If there's a scrum in front and someone takes an elbow to the face in a sea of, like, six, seven bodies, okay. I understand the refs missing that. Generally speaking, the only thing with the refs that really, truly gets my blood boiling is when it's obvious game management. Where we're not going to call this because that team had four penalties and this one's only had one, so we're not going to give them another one. Or this team scored on three power plays, so you know we don't want to just let them control the game that way. But there are missed calls that are so obvious. I, I genuinely don't believe the referees had any ill intent when they missed that call. I don't think that was a game management call. I can't fathom what they thought happened there to not call it. <laughs> this is one of those ones where, you know, it's Occam's razor. The answer is just general incompetence. Yeah. And that's what this was. It's hard for me to forgive a ref who's at the highest level of hockey you can referee not calling it. If it was one ref who had a weird angle and it might have looked like Jaden Schwartz tripped and had a bit of a yard sale. Okay. There's four of them out there. For all four of them to miss that, that's inexcusable. Yeah. Like there's subjective calls. You know, what's a lineman going to call offside in real time? Like that happens in a flash, like in an instant. You can't really fault them for not being as fast as a camera or whatever else. The Sherratt... Penalty violation. Sherratt's helmet came off because I don't think he does it up very tightly. So his helmet came off in the corner. He made an immediate play for the puck, which he was entitled to do. And then after, instead of making a beeline for the bench, it was kind of like a 50-50. Is that play continuing? And he didn't really make a beeline for the bench. And he still moved towards the puck. And then he was pinned in. And by rule, yeah, he deserved that penalty. I personally hate that penalty. And to me, that's one of those subjective penalties where I think the ref could have given him a little leeway and then went over to him and said, hey, that is the last time you're getting that much kind of latitude to do this. Don't do it again and also do up your helmet tighter. He called the penalty and I thought, I don't like the rule. I think he could have given him more leeway, but it's subjective. You can forgive him for that. You can forgive people for making the offside mistake. You can forgive him for, you know, missing a goal that went just tucked in just under the bar and you couldn't really see it because it didn't, whatever. But that one, like that is, you need to be doing your job at a standard level, otherwise you're going to get an entire 20,000-seat arena saying, ref, you suck, justifiably on a Tuesday night. So that's how that turned out for the Red Wings. Again, I think two things are true here. The Red Wings didn't really shut down Seattle. Where in, like Seattle deserved to win that game overall. I think they were the better team. But Detroit also did enough to win that game in that call in my mind, affected the outcome. People don't like that. I, I think I tried to articulate that point on Twitter and a lot of people got frustrated, which I get. Everyone's angry after the missed call, but I think it's fair to say that both things can be true here. Yeah, there's a million different plays that happen in a game that impact the outcome. But man, that is an all-timer <laughs> missed call. That, that is, is a, that ha if, if it was an important game, that would be remembered forever. Ice hockey gifts and A Wood, there those are gonna be in there in some of those, you know, highlight packages for a long time. Yeah. 
Let's talk about some of the good things from that game. Dylan Larkin points in all seven games this season. Another three-point game for Dylan Larkin. And at the end of the night, he was tied with Jack Hughes for the point lead in the NHL. Evan, you remember the Patreon exclusive episode we did with Ryan? Hot take, warm take, nuclear take? Yes, but I don't remember the content. Well, one of my hot takes. We've never had, we've done that episode yearly for how long? and we've oh, forever. Ne- and we've never had one hit. My Dylan Larkin 90 plus point take looks like it might actually hit this year. Barring injury, it's looking pretty likely at this point. Although my Carter Mazur hot take got immediately wiped out when he got injured literally the next day. So <laughs> That's just how math works, really. <laughs> Seven games in and Dylan Larkin has three single point games, three three point games, and a two point game. Not bad. Yeah, it's pretty okay. He is on another level this season. We, I think we've said this every episode since the year started, but you can tell how he's elevated his game, and it's not just a product of Debrinket scoring goals or passing to him or it anything helps. like that. It helps. Like, <laughs> having having Debrinket, having Goss Despair on the power play as well, Like it does help quite a bit, but he is playing to another level. And one thing that I want to point out, and it's not talked about a lot in the NHL, is everyone knows what happens in contract years. Good players really kind of excel and they elevate and Dylan Larkin did that last year you saw him play the best hockey we've ever seen him play and he continued his improvement anyone who said they were scared about what happens to Dylan Larkin or any player in that situation after they secured the bag so to speak I think that was a very legitimate fear you've seen it time and time again in professional sports it's not surprising but it's good to see that this does not apply to Dylan Larkin he is still grinding to be absolutely the best player he can be and elevating that level year after year after year. He's never struck me as that type of person. No. He always seems to just be extremely focused on always being better and has a very strong team first mentality, and it's probably why he's the captain of the team. So, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm not surprised he's continuing to grow as a player, but... It's certainly great to see after you sign the big ticket to continue to put up career numbers. Yeah. So Dylan Larkin continued that story. A lot of it on the power play as well, which is, you know, after an 0-5 night, the 3-6 and night showed that that's still one of the league's best power plays, if not the best power play in the league right now. Alex Dabrinkit, just the dude just scores goals. And that was a clutch goal too. For a second there, that looked like it was going to be the game-winning goal. His scoring touch, especially at... The LCA is, we're not going to stop talking about it as long as he's doing it. I think we came into the season saying Debrinkit's goal scoring is, you know, a talent of his. We think it's going to come back. We don't think the 27 goals that uh, he had in Ottawa are going to be his standard. But maybe let's not book him in for 40 right away because that would be a really tough ask. I only meant for like the before Christmas when I said uh, less than 30. Have the Red Wings ever had a Rocket Richard Trophy winner? No, it's a recent trophy, but no. Hmm. Interesting. Leads the league. We talked about Larkin leading the league in points, tied with Jack Hughes at 14. Alex Dabrinkit, nine goals through seven games, leads the league. Sam Reinhart and Austin Matthews with seven behind him. Oh, yeah, Sam Reinhart. That's exactly who I expected to be right there. Well, the Matthews. Brock Bester, I think, is the most surprising up there so far with six. Like, I... When you have four on opening night, it gives you a bit of a head start. It does help. He scored those four. I was like, I was so for bringing in Brock Besser just like for very cheap. And I'm I'm so upset that, well, I mean, every other team in the league passed on it. So obviously Vancouver wasn't going to do it. But anyways. Well, Brock Besser is basically just wish.com Alex to bring it. So this still worked out for us. Hey, we'll take another one. (laughs) That is a great point. What are the heights for Alex to bring school scoring this year? Well, I just alluded to the Rocket Richard. He's going to be in the race. Like, it's so early. We're not going to pencil him in, but I'm just saying. No, I'm going to. I'm writing it with pen. Not on the table, please. It's okay. a nice custom winged wheel podcast table, Brad. Well, you don't have a notepad for That's me. That's true. So I don't I'm think any writing... of us can read or write. Uh, then, I, then I have to learn how to write. <laughs> <laughs> no, Alex Debrinkit. Yeah, it's early. The, the, you know, the caveat that's going to exist until, I don't know, maybe Thanksgiving here, but it's early. He is sure scoring like a guy who's going to be in the mix. And 40 goals looks like it's in the cards. I would say so based on the start. It's, I hate to say it, it's all about, you know, health and staying healthy and this team not getting into a deep rut. Because I think there are superstars like Austin Matthews, Miko Rantanen, 
Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid, who once they get a taste, they can absolutely take off and, and go for 50, 60 goals. But I mean, at this exact moment, Alex Zabrinka leads the league. So there obviously is a possibility. He, he's currently on pace for 105 goals. So I think 40 is well in the range of possibilities. Yeah, that, I feel like that's okay. I feel like at his current pace, anything less than 70 is probably yeah, he'll, slightly disappointing. He'll regress to the meaning at 65. Well, and it also depends. Like, you need Detroit's power play to stay hot. And we've said time and time again that it's not going to stay at this pace all year. But it doesn't look like he's the kind of guy. Yeah, his shooting percentage is high. I always struggle with that. Like, is he going to be scoring 105.42857 goals this year? No. Um, well, not with that attitude. And yeah, the shooting percentage is likely to come down. But whenever the averages get applied to someone, in like an instant in a tangential basis. I'm like, yeah, because he's shooting well. Like not everyone shoots the same. Not everyone has the same same shooting talent. Otherwise, we wouldn't get dunked on so much for our Philip Zadina takes over the years because the guy would have shot and scored more. His shooting talent disappeared when he got to the NHL. Anyhow, DeBrinket scoring automatic like clockwork at this point in him and Larkin. He's part of what has helped Larkin to ascend, but I, I think it's bringing the most out of uh, each other. Goss is spare though, man. I like... What he brings, I think on any given night, he is often Detroit's best defenseman. It's not really a knock on Mo Sider. I don't think Sider's having the best start to the season, but even Mo Sider's not the best start to the season. He's still putting up points and punching Matty Beniers in the face, so we'll take it. But Goss to spare. His shot is a weapon. His offensive acumen is a weapon. The way he's factored into that power play is part of a big part of what's elevated it. He's another guy where you're like, I'm disappointed he's only signed for a year. For Jan- now. January 1st. Yeah. Mark it on your calendars. Extension's an option. And that's the kind of thing where it's like it's going to be more pricey because they signed him cheaper at first. But he performs like this, man. You add in Goss's bear, you keep Wallman, you extended him previously. Your defensive core is starting to shape up in such a way where your young pieces are going to come and fit in where they fit in. And you have a fully fleshed out defensive core that can contribute offensively. Detroit over the balance of the game, like we've said time in time again today they weren't the better team i don't think they let seattle have a lot of pressure they looked a little bit disorganized at times but when their offense woke up which i think that missed call really pissed them off that power play looks unstoppable well when you can skill your way out of problems it opens up uh i don't know else to say it a whole new world yeah in terms of how the season could go like a justin hall new world we're talking about skill that's here good. i uh, i am too that's good Hey, Justin Hall, I don't know if he still is, but NHL leader in plus minus. Tied. Tied now? Tied as of last night when I checked. Ah. That's very generous of him. Yeah, that is. Tied with Quinn Hughes, and frankly, that's a huge compliment to Quinn Hughes. Yeah, good on you, Quinn Hughes. You're getting there, buddy. He's keeping up with Justin Hall. That's impressive. We should talk <laughs> about Quinn Hughes more. Uh, the the Detroit decor, I think, has work to do, but you mentioned this last episode, Brad. There have been very few like actual pain points Throughout seven games so far. I think Petrie obviously has had a really rough start to the year. He, I think, is going to be iffy to get in next game. We'll see because he both has to get healthy and Lalone has to decide whether he wants to cycle him in or not. But, you know, what are the worst parts of Detroit's game right now? Cider is still doing well but is kind of trying to force a little bit too much and making some mistakes that you know he's better than and it will come out of his game. He seems to start seasons this way. You know, this is three years in a row now where it happened. So, you know, it's just going to kind of shake off but other than that things have been going reasonably well on D there's been some miscommunication between the D partners uh when the puck goes high to low or vice versa I've noticed guys get out of position and then other teams have been capitalizing I noticed that a lot last night against Seattle so I mean we're how many games in this is always a work in progress especially with a decor that's had some additions so it's that's a very minor gripe Okay, before we jump into what's happening next for Detroit, I want to have the OT rule argument. So watching three-on-three overtime, and no, I'm not just saying this because it was Seattle doing it. Detroit does it too. Every team in the league does it. But when three-on-three overtime came out, it was chaos, like NHL hits, not in terms of like the physicality, but just chaos, end-to-end, nonstop action, and often a goal based off of a mistake or, or breakout or whatever. And then teams learned how to do it. Coaches ruin everything, as is their job. 
but they learned that they could just leave the zone, which seems counterintuitive, and not just leave the zone. They would cross back over the red line and maybe even go back as far as their defensive zone just to return Pass it to their goalie. Yeah, and it works because they keep possession because that is the name of the game in three-on-three overtime. Even shots, like they pass up shots because they know if it is going to be rebounded in a big way or go off the glass, then that's a break the other direction, and you don't have the defensive safety valve that you're often used to having. And it makes for a terrible entertainment product. Like, it is not fun to watch. I'd rather watch that than see, like, a million shootouts. That's just me. But I think there needs to be a rule change for three-on-three overtime to stop the killing of time. My opinion is if you intentionally leave the offensive zone to retain possession, the play is called dead, and the offending team's defensive zone is where the faceoff happens. So it goes all the way down. The only thing is... If you want to speed up three on three overtime, implementing more face offs isn't going to help. I'm not. I'm not worried about speeding it up though. I'm worried about not slowing it down. You know what I mean? Like a break and play is whatever, but then a face off is immediate. Like it, it, teams aren't going to do it. It's not going to cause a ton of face offs because teams just aren't going to do it. It's going to force them to take the shots and stay in the zone. Cycle around the offensive zone all you want. At some point, you have to ask the defense to play defense. But to me, I, I don't care about slowing the game down that much. I, I will say I'm in favor of literally any rule mm-hmm. that's going to help. So I'm I'm not necessarily against the over and back rule. I just don't think it's going to have the full intended effect we would want it to because we've seen teams run prolonged cycles at five on five play with not much happening. Teams will still run prolonged cycles at three on three just because they can't leave the ozone doesn't mean they can't kill a whole lot of time just holding on to it in the ozone. I. Wouldn't mind if that's the solution. I think just to speed it up, like a 15-second shot clock or however you want to track that, because then it forces action. You have to get that puck to the net. To me, that feels like not hockey. We're playing three-on-three, man. I know. And then we're going to a shootout after this. Like, that ship has sailed. I don't give a crap (laughs) about authenticity anymore. (laughs) But then what constitutes a shot? Uh, like A puck that hits the goalie or the net. Like, leaving your stick? What if it gets blocked? Like I don't know. I don't. If it gets blocked, it's like the NBA. It's... If it doesn't hit the rim, it's not a shot. No, but the NBA is so much easier to get a shot off. The NHL getting a shot through is difficult. Then get it through. I, like, I'm here for K. If you can't... Here's the thing, though. Even if the shot is blocked, something's happening. The defensive team could get possession off of wherever it ricochets to and goes down on an odd man rush. The other team has to scramble to recoup it and then get it to the net as fast as they can. Horn sounds just as someone is putting... Pulling the shot off, the shot goes in. There's a review to decide if they got the shot off before the horn. Brad, you will absolutely burst a blood vessel screaming. Anything to bring more reviews into hockey, I'm here for. (laughs) Yeah. Now, there's a million ways you could interpret this rule. Like, the ref could be watching the shot clock. Oh, that's what we want. I know. I'm not. I'm not. They can't even watch the play. <laughs> but maybe there could be some kind of like... I'm watching you, Deeds. I'm watching that squirrel over there. <laughs> like in the NBA, if it leaves your hand, it's clean. It's good. It's whatever. And if it goes in the net, it's one thing to have a review over, uh, you know, <laughs> I was going to say something. It's a, over a hair on the blue line. If you're getting a review to see if someone beat the clock on an OT winner, people are going to be invested in that review. There's actually, oh, no, no, there's tension. No. I don't love it, but it forces action because I think you're a smart guy, but this has to be one of the worst ideas you've ever had. So I'm not in favor of reviews, but I'm also understanding that the buzzer beaters are going to be so few and far between. The sheer amount of action you're going to get out of it, and every other three on three OT is going to cancel it out. Because, again, you're forcing shots. You're forcing teams to relinquish possession. You're not just cycling until you get something you like. I guarantee if we, even with the over and back, which I'm with you on, it's a huge improvement over what we have now. You're going to get minute-long cycles where nothing happens in the ozone. Because the defense is going to be too afraid to press. The offense is going to see something they don't like. And they're just going to run it around the outside. It's going to happen. At least this way, you either do something or you lose the puck. 
I, don't, I haven't fully thought this out because I sort of came up with it while we were talking. What if you get rid of the the loser point? Would that improve or deprove? Or Teams de-pro- would play so scared. That would make it so much worse. But then on the counter argument, it's like we really need two points. we got to play offense. No, I think it- – I, I I think that's a whole different conversation though because I I think the they should go to a three point system three for a regulation win two for an overtime or shootout win and then we're gonna have air adjusted best team regular seasons who and cares? we have that for everything already because the eighty screwed everything up that is true the nerds can do all that it's us nerds like I don't know I don't see that solving this though all right let's just get rid of overtime then go right to a shootout or nothing at all <laughs> wow an idea worse than Brad's. You're right. I am pissed off at that. But you like you can't be that late for this episode and come up with such a bullshit idea. You have to start with the lowest day. point players on Hold your on. team. Hold on, we gotta we gotta continue to make this worse. No overtime, no shootout. We end in ties. <laughs> How about this? American. We have the shot clock, and then the reviews are sponsored by companies, <laughs> and the ads come across the screen. You, you can make live bets on whether or not he got it off in time. This, <laughs> live, bre- this live bet brought to you by the Wing Wheel Podcast. Let's zoom in to see if this crossed the line in time. <laughs> All right, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this my Ryan Hanna's last ever episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. I am uh, no longer interested in doing <laughs> Well, that went off the rails. Let's move forward here. Uh, <laughs> the Red Wings end up with the one point against Seattle. Their next two games before we talk to you next are Thursday at home against Winnipeg, 7 p.m. Eastern, and then Saturday in Boston, 7 p.m. Eastern, and then we'll be back with you on Sunday evening. That is what they have coming up. Some injury updates for the Red Wings, actually. I mentioned Clem Costin is going to be back in. He's uh, he's recovered now. Petrie is on the fence. And as of tonight, Wednesday night, Alex Dabrinka didn't practice today because he was feeling un- under the weather. So they're just going to kind of monitor that as his uh, readiness goes on. So I don't know if that's going to carry over to the game. By the time you're listening, you'll probably know. But that is what's coming up for Detroit. All right. I want to mention something quickly here. And that is uh, Max Boltman, good friend of the show, posted on The Athletic Detroit what I think was a really, really good, insightful article that offered a really, uh, you know, poignant extra layer beyond just the celebrations of all of Detroit's winning. And this came after the win against Calgary, which was, it was a conversation about whether the winning was sustainable. And it wasn't Max's commentary on it, but instead it was, what did the Red Wings think about this? And it was really interesting to hear from Larkin and hear from Derek Lalone on what their perception of all this winning is. And I was a little bit surprised reading it. I encourage everyone to go read it. I'll link to it in the description. But essentially the gist of it is, is they're all business. You know, the Red Wings have every excuse to come into this after the win on, on Sunday against Calgary and say, this is lights out. Oh my God, the team has finally arrived. We're going to do this. We know we have the team to keep doing this. Let's go, boys. We got this. But instead it seemed not worried, but very measured to say, this is, you know, good, and we're not saying that we don't deserve it, but Lalone said, like, this is a run hot, and not every six-game stretch is going to be, you know, this every time, but we're going to absolutely take it, and the guys deserve it. And Larkin very much was uh, portraying someone who's been through so much terrible hockey and losing hockey that he's not interested in celebrating after six games. Like, he wants to do whatever it takes and make sure that they, they capture this you know, lightning in a bottle and cement it as much in their team's DNA and the way they play hockey and the way they come together as a group, wherein it's, I mean, obviously, because it was through six games at this point, but it's very much like a jobs not finished mentality. So it wasn't like to refute fans or us or anyone who was celebrating because it was all like Max laid out, like it is what a phenomenal start to the season the Red Wings have had. But I thought that that look into the locker room was really, really interesting in seeing how the leadership in Detroit was like, all right, this is just step one. We have to make sure that we are still just as good when things aren't bouncing our way, when you know we don't get the lucky bounces or the power play does go cold or if there is an injury, like we need to still find a way to be this good of a hockey team. And I thought that was a, an interesting look at the team. Yeah, it's, you know, the NHL is a game of throwaway phrases and percentages. And over the course of a season... You're going to get points in games you had no business getting points in, like last night against Seattle. You're going to win games you had no business winning because hockey's random and the inverse is true as well. This is why you hear coaches and organizations always throw 
around the phrase, you know, the process, do the right things. And to us fans, we hear it so much, goes in one ear, out the other, and it almost doesn't mean anything to us. But this is kind of the context in why it matters. If you go to the rink and you do the right things every day and you play the right way and you do, and and this doesn't mean like no skill. I'm not going into old hockey man terms here, but if the Red Wings keep doing what they they're doing every day when they get to the rink, yeah, they're not going to win five out of every six, but if they keep doing this, they're going to win a hell of a lot more than they lose. The whole thing with, and for Lalonde especially is don't change process yeah don't change the approach yeah the results are never ever gonna be a hundred percent that's just hockey that's just sports but it all balances out in the percentages over the course of the year and i'd say that great teams in any sport really um but especially in hockey is you know the the regular season is just a place to get that process ironed out and you know really come together as a group and understand that, you know, their job really starts or where their aspirations start is in the playoffs. They're just using now to, you know, get the team into the right sort of mindset and get those processes in place to be successful when the playoffs roll around. And I do think that's something that, you know, whether we believe it or not, I think the Red Wings, you know, need to get in that mindset of if we're going to be contenders at some point, we have to be in this process and just, use the regular season as the 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 building area for when when we are in the playoffs not if we're in the playoffs when people ask you know what is Derek Lalonde bringing over from Tampa Bay this is the kind of thing like yeah systems personnel decisions the way you approach the game of course like those minutia are all there big and small but I think the mentality, like that kind of mentality, is exactly what he's brought over from what was, and still is in my mind, a winning culture, a cup competitive culture in Tampa Bay. It's why teams like them in Boston just never seem to regress yeah. because they have these guys who have built this you know, hockey culture or mentality, and when new people come in the room, they buy in immediately, and yeah. they, just cannot, they just don't get worse as a team. I was talking to Max about it. Like in previous years, Detroit seemed listless and just kind of floating, and they didn't have an identity. And even last year, you saw it start to come together, but it was very much a formative year. This year, it feels like the identity is there. Red Wings fans who have watched for a long time know who Dylan Larkin is, know who Michael Rasmussen is. They know the kind of players these guys are. But it seems like this is really the first time Detroit is coming together as the Detroit Red Wings. This is what it's like to come into Hockey Town and play you know, you're going to get punched in the face. We are going to light you up on the power play. This is the culture that we have. And obviously not everyone has insights into what's happening in the dressing room. I think hockey is one of the toughest sports to get those insights into. But very obviously you can see how cohesive this team is. And so when and folks get frustrated when you talk about locker room value of depth players or whatever, it, those kinds of things do add up to this. So I think you both made really great points there. And it, it's a what we're seeing now is an early – that ever present caveat, it's an early culmination or an early representation of, you know, the kind of successful culture that Detroit is trying to build, that Steve Eisman is trying to build, that Derek Lalone is trying to build. So, yeah, I think that was a, a cool little peek behind the curtain. All right, let's get into some NHL news here. The NHL gave us news as we were prepping, which was nice. They have voted to decentralize the NHL draft. So we talked about this in a previous episode, what we thought – it would mean if they did it, and essentially the NHL went out to the various leadership groups around the league. They ask every team, what would you feel about this? How would you feel about kind of doing an NBA, NFL style where everyone can be at home base? The players are still there, whatever it might be, and you know the party is still happening, but the teams themselves don't have to travel in. And it looks like the NHL has voted in favor of it. The f- final details, I think, are going to be worked on over the next little while, but this is the direction that they're going to go. And I think there's benefits for the league logistically. And I think there's going to be some risks and challenges here too. This is an entertainment product and they can't forget that. And that's my only real concern here because I understand the drawbacks to decentralizing it, but most of that has almost no impact on fans. The media gets hurt a little bit. You might see, I'm curious to see how it reflects the trade market. Cause some teams were saying, there's going to be less chatter, but then there's also going to be less hesitation to talk because people won't overhear you, you know, 
draft lists won't be seen, trade proposals won't be heard, conversations won't be heard, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm not super concerned about that one way or the other. The draft is a work in progress and has been for years. They seem to have the concept down, but the execution's been bad. It's slow. It's choppy. You get a million teams up there thanking the city, congratulating the cup champions, bringing someone else to make the pick, and it really slows down the process, and it's not very fan-friendly. We are all super invested in it because we love the draft, but when you actually step back from how much you love the concept of the draft, the execution of it in years has been poor from a fan perspective. This, as we talked about a couple episodes ago, opens up a world of possibilities. I keep going back to the NFL draft because, to me, they do a masterful job Mm -hmm. of making the draft super fan-centric and fan-friendly without taking the moment away from the players. Yeah. And if the NHL can adopt something more similar to that, turn it into a week-long event. Uh, I know Freeman was talking about the NBA has like a convention around the draft just to celebrate the sport, celebrate the league, which would be a fantastic idea for the NHL to steal. Just don't have the commissioner. I don't want Gary Bettman (laughs) giving the player their jerseys or whatever the hell they're doing, please. But yeah, just having a representative and the player come up on stage, have the fans right there in front of the stage, going nuts, having a great time, amazing experience for the players. There is a real way to make this a better product. I have so many reservations about the NHL. That is <laughs> executing this properly. That is my entire caveat to this whole thing is, you know, from a podcast perspective, if the teams are there, that's great for us because we can network. Like, that's awesome. But just thinking from a fan perspective, I don't really care where the teams are. Be on the surface of Mars for all I care. I want to be entertained. Somehow, um, Matt Damon's there again. Yeah, somehow, uh, it's fixing a spaceship with a uh, with a paperclip and duct tape. That's right. You, you joke about that, but the surprise Matt Damon thing is real. And you know, one draft in the next few years, he's coming out to announce like the Nashville pick or something. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's all going to be in the execution of how the NHL makes this more entertaining, and that's where I draw a lot of pause because. I don't have very high, believe it or not, I don't have high confidence in the NHL to pull this off. I'm there's a lot of fantastic ideas, and we've talked about it on this podcast before about about options there. I'm in a very wait and see sort of state with this, and to see sort of what the the finer details are, because if there's anybody who gets in their way other than the PGA, it's it's the NHL. It's a good recovery from your two god awful, like offensive to my ears opinions on. Uh, overtime rules. Because that I, is the most confident I've ever heard someone about being wrong. But I. But continue. <laughs> you know, we've been doing this podcast for almost nine years, and that is the most confident. You've heard me say some dumb stuff. Yeah, this is kind of your thing, isn't it? Nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I was going to say, I think both Brad and Evan are right here. Brad said the NHL has a big opportunity here, and it, it's not necessarily guaranteed to go right, but they have a big opportunity to do this well. And Evan, I think you're right. The NHL has not earned the vote of confidence so far that they will do this right. And I agree. I, I think, you know, when we had that discussion, I saw some of the feedback we got and it was a, it was a really good conversation that I felt was happening, which was, oh, your points about, you know, bringing too many guys up, blah, blah, blah. They have, it, this is always going to go this slow because that's how it's designed. And do you, don't you remember, you know, the Zoom draft, for example, during COVID, that was the, the worst day of my life. I can't believe Jim Nill voted for this. I, or like, I guess he can go to bed earlier. That's right. <laughs> but the NHL needs to make sure that this isn't run by the people who don't know how to do it. And I mean... You bring in an events company that has a track record. What are the people who do the Super Bowl doing at that time? Uh, Nothing. Yeah, straight up, call the NFL. Call the people who run the NFL draft and have them do it. Like the technology, the entertainment, the execution, it all needs to be flawless. It is a great opportunity to do something very cool. It doesn't have to be innovative. You can copy, you can play it safe, whatever. But the execution has to be clean. It has to be efficient. And don't don't let NHL GMs run how this runs. Do you know what I mean? Like these guys aren't So this is not gonna go well. Entertainment pros, they're not tech pros. Like this has to be run in such a way where the people tuning in get something of value. Because at the end of the day, if you make your picks, the NHL teams get what they want. The one thing that this could actually help with, speaking of don't let old hockey men get involved with this, the teams 
are not going to care what's actually going on at the draft, which should actually free up the entertainment value. If you're Steve Eisenman in the brass, he's in the war room at the LCA. He has no concept. Clue he's going to be in his or, office with that hoodie yeah, he's always wearing. Yeah, he's going to have no clue what's going on at like the Sphere in Vegas or whatever. He doesn't care. He's if it's at the Sphere, I've taken back anything bad I've ever said about the NHL. <laughs> yeah, we're going. I will officially start a NHL referee <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Imagine this fear is just Gary Bettman's head for the entirety of the day. I was going to say it's just like a hyper zoom of like a distorted Steve Eisenman face <laughs> with the laser eyes and everything. But yeah, because then this frees up the teams to not have to worry about the process because they're going to spend the whole time in their war room worrying about their draft and their draft alone. And I understand the logistics of why they want it decentralized because drafts over. All right, we're already here. Let's start prepping our free agency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes a lot of logistical sense. Again, my only reservation here. Is it's in the NHL's hands to do this right. Like even when they have good ideas, they still always find a way to trip over themselves. So I have a feeling that's exactly what's gonna happen here. They're gonna lay out this beautiful plan and we're all gonna go, This is amazing. And then they're gonna finish it with one sentence that ruins the whole so thing. So it's Firefest. Yeah, essentially. Okay. You know, I think that is that is my prediction is the NHL draft will become Firefest. To I, me, the biggest thing, especially because there's been whispers about concerns about a- fan attendance at games this year is you have to get the fans there and you got to get them spending money whether that's tickets or buying merchandise or whatever you've got to get them involved and it has to be entertaining i want to do a small rant before i move us along here those discussions on like the fan attendance are so funny because it's real like fan attendance is showing up as a problem in a lot of markets who are they can't afford to have downtime and they're showing up in markets that are generally very strong, which is a bad indicator. And there's all these galaxy brained ideas about why it is and what's happening. You know what's happening? Interest rates are going up. There's an economic decline and prices are going up. People can't always afford the insane price of tickets that are rising and rising and rising and rising and rising. And frankly, I'm going to be shooting like my own argument in the foot for a lot of different things here. Teams don't want to pay that much money to see bad teams, you know? So, like, your GMs are in this tough spot where they're like, do we do a proper rebuild, which has a lot of risk and could take a long time, or do we do what L.A. did because they can't, they, like, you don't want to suck that bad because fans are going to stop coming. In prosperous times where people have cheap money, they have a lot of money, whatever, blah, 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 they'll still come out to the games. That's a social thing to do. It's a thing to do with the family. It's part of the community. But when you're tight for cash, I'm sorry. You're not spending 400 bucks on tickets to go see a bad team no and so those those conversations have i've been laughing because i'm like yeah, people don't have money what do you want but people might go to a draft if tickets totally. are i don't know 50 bucks i'm just making up a number off the top of my head or yeah. they're like oh uh all, there, there's gonna be a all these podcasters are gonna have a room at a convention and i can meet all these podcasters at once and they're gonna do a live q a about Unbiased social idea. media i love evan and planting I'm, the seeds <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm going to be up there with Steve Eiserman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's so many things that they could do, but I think at the heart of it, they need to make have the fans' perspective and, and, and cater to the fans most if they want to really pull this off. Well, that's the beauty of this. And they made this decision to ki- give the teams what they want, to give them the logistics. Okay, so that part is done. They have, again, none of this is finalized. They're actually still working at the process, but the teams have voted. The teams got what they want. So now the only thought going forward should be about the fans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The presentation, the theatrics of it all. We'll see. It's my job as now, Ryan, the optimist this season, to say I think the NHL is moving in the right direction and they're going to do this well because they're going to want to not lose the logistical efficiencies that are come with are going to come with not having to move the team's uh, personnel from their home city to Nashville or Vegas. I'm sure or they whatever. had a terrible time convincing people to go to Nashville. No, it's not that, but they lost so much time like draft on the 28th and then free agency on the 1st and like qualifying offers. Like there was quite a process and you often Well, it's a good thing they don't talk about those before July 1 or anything. To me the simple answer is move everything up, shorten the preseason, yeah, me shorten, too. but whatever. Uh Things that the NHL is doing well, NHL Edge, they brought the advanced puck tracking and player data that they've been talking about for a long, long time. It was proposed long a uh, while ago, but COVID and a few other things, I think they had to try to find a way to get the chip in the puck properly. It slowed everything down, but finally the NHL has released a portal into 
what is really highly advanced uh, statistics that hasn't really been publicly available before. I think teams have had this data and some really clever folks have found a way to manipulate whatever publicly available data there was into some useful stuff. But the NHL has essentially opened up a treasure chest of information for if you're a casual fan to peer in and see who are the fastest skaters in the league that are defensemen that have played, you know, X amount of minutes or whatever to people who like uh, Micah McCurdy in hockey viz or anyone who does like Dom with the athletic, they, they can now have this treasure trove of information and do some really cool stuff with it. So I like, I thought that was really, really cool uh, of the NHL to do. I was kind of caught off guard because it's been so long since they talked about it, but edge.nhl.com. I will just say, be careful. It's very exciting to see all that information. Just be careful drawing conclusions. Fastest player doesn't mean goodest player. Hardest shot doesn't mean best shot. Like that's the kind of stuff where it's like the information tells you what the information is telling you and be careful extrapolating beyond that. Okay, uh, a couple things. A little while back, I put out an announcement for folks to say uh, we need some help with Wings Money on the board this year and running it and doing the administration and all of that. And the outpouring of interest and support we got from some extremely qualified folks has been uh, really amazing. Uh, I'm not ignoring you. We are sifting through that while trying to get through the start of the season and uh, settle our lives down. I think all three of us are done getting sick for the time being. And Brad, I'm sure you'll start the cycle up again. Uh, Mika just got really sick yesterday, so okay. I'm a couple days away. Yeah, When's the next are. meetup? So probably next week I'll be sick again. Did you just ask when the next f***ing meetup is? Just as a joke. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you you are digging into my side of the knife today, huh? You feel it, and you're like, let's have some fun. Yep, yep. That's all staying in. It's because I've had a bad day, so that's how you know. Yeah, mine's been peachy. Uh, Red Wings lose one game, and it all falls apart. <laughs> yeah, we come apart at the seams. The, the interest has been amazing. Thank you all so very much. We will be responding to each and every one of you who were interested. Obviously, we would love to have everyone help. I don't think that's a good use of your time. Uh, But we'll be reaching out to at least a few of you to say, like, let's see how we can move forward. So thank you very, very, very much. Uh, You'll all be hearing back uh, very soon. And thank you to all of you who have participated in the most recent Wings Money in the Board special event. And shout out to Prashanth for uh, facilitating it. I was uh, not able to do so. Uh, We were on a little mini moon. We did a little winery tour. Uh, So between that and covering games, couldn't uh, run it. So Prashanth did it, and you all raised over $1,650 just in one night for the Jamie Daniels Foundation, which was excellent. And we're going to definitely have more of those games throughout the season. Prizes included six-month subscriptions to Sean Shapiro's Shap Shots and Alex Debrinkit jersey, courtesy of us, the Winged Wheel Podcast, and uh, in addition to that, a Winged Wheel Podcast quarter zip. So uh, some great prizes that we gave away, and you raised some fantastic funds for the Jamie Daniels Foundation. All right, let's jump into overtime. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash podcast. If you want to support the show, you get access to our Patreon-exclusive Discord, which is a fantastic community. You're also automatically entered into all of our giveaways. Uh, for every home game this season for the Red Wings, we're giving away two tickets. The vast, vast majority are going to our Patreon supporters. You'll have seen us retweeting them. Uh, they're great mezzanine seats. Uh, and if you're a Patreon supporter, you can enter to be eligible to win those tickets. You'll also get access to our Patreon exclusive bonus overtime episodes and any other bonus content that we put out. Those record right after these main shows. They're a lot of fun. We let loose. They're somehow more unhinged than main shows like today. Uh, All of that and lots more. And you help us do everything that we do. We can't host Winged Wheel Podcast Nights at the LCA, support the Jamie Daniels Foundation, uh, produce shows like Expected by Whom, hosted by Prashanth Iyer, Sean Shapiro, or any of that without our patron support. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Let's take some questions for our patrons. Irish wristwatch switch swath says, Evan, how confident are you in the Red Wings that they'll get enough wins throughout the season so that their total standings points is a bigger number than Ryan's best round of golf by the time the regular season ends? Wow. My best was a 96. You know, I got out there yesterday and I will tell you, I would have been better off doing absolutely anything else in the world. I actually stopped keeping score at some point. I'm like, this is a joke. Where like fall golf is like this late in the year is just miserable right off. Um, I don't know what I said in the pre or the season preview episode, but I think it started with an eight. Yeah. You don't think so if, if for it to improve by like 10 ish percent, you've seen the start that they've had that, that you're allowed to use that information. Can they, can they, 
Basically, do they crack 100 points is the question. And I'm going to say no. They only needed 96. I'm going to say no. <laughs> which is still five points better than my prediction, which was the most optimistic. If you didn't shoot the 96, what was the next best, 101? 102. Oh, yeah. that would Then that would have been a very hard no. Yeah, absolutely not. I'm thinking about it now, which at the start of the year, I said they're going to be seventh in this division. And now that I'm thinking about it, that's a big change in uh, mindset. Between the Red Wings and Ryan both overperforming, this has made it a conversation. What a year it's been. <laughs> I know, but I'll tell you. What a quarter it's been. <laughs> that's right. Apple Cider says, uh, God, it's fun to be a Detroit sports fan right now. What are your opinions on doing cross sports alternate jerseys? I'd love to see the Lions rep a Red Wing style helmet. I love that. But I, then the fans get something cool and they sell more jerseys. So I'm not sure that's a great idea. That's right. I think that's the kind of stuff that is absolutely should be done more uh, across professional sports. It also builds a little bit of identity across, you know, leagues and cities as well. I would a Detroit Tigers like gray, dark gray, blue, and orange somehow yes. styled into the hockey like a hockey out uniform. Oh, I'm here for it. They're, I've seen some really good mock-ups to that end as well. They could do brown gloves, so they look like uh, gloves. Like oh, oh, I'm here for it. You into it? Oh, of course. Who wouldn't be? Have you guys seen the what the NBA is doing with jerseys right now? The NBA is doing too much. They are going through their era that the NHL went through when Reebok came in and everything was piping and terrible and the stupid, like, the logo was just the name on the front. Well, actually, basketball-style jersey logo. I'm thinking of you, Dallas. But they're going through their worst jersey era I've seen in a long time. Like, Miami's the only team saving it. That's rough, man. And they can do some really cool stuff, too. They have done really cool stuff. Oh, yeah, the Miami Vice jerseys? Oh, God. Those are the, so sick. Yeah. Every other jersey in the NBA is awful. <laughs> for the most part this year. Simon says, 27, says, I love the way the boys are playing lately, but I wonder why Charnik has a roster spot over a guy like Casper. I know they want Casper to get top six minutes, but wouldn't any NHL time be beneficial and then decide to move him up the lineup? I hate being an armchair GM, so I just ask questions. Uh, if Casper was, like, good enough where even those 9 to 14 NHL minutes would be impactful and beneficial for him, I think that would be a very good question or a very real consideration. I just don't think he's there right now. I think he didn't have the camp to earn that spot, and he still has a lot of developing to do before he's even like a nine-minute in the NHL kind of guy. Yeah, and if you want Casper to be any sort of offensive threat in the NHL, he's got to develop that somewhere. And you put him in the NHL for nine or 20 minutes right now, it doesn't matter. He does not, his offense is not where it needs to be, and putting him in a better league would only stunt that further. The NHL is a tough league. As Evan likes to say, it's a big boys league, and not that Casper's not the kind of player who can hang with that. He's played in a pro league. He's a very physical guy. He can hold his own, but it's not a very forgiving league if you're a player who needs to learn. It's not a development league, plain and simple. You're a shooter who needs time and space. You got to figure that out before you get to the NHL because all of a sudden your production is going to go away. You can't hang physically. Uh, you can only talent your way out of that for so long. Like It is a fast, hard, talented league that's tough from top to bottom. He's already experienced one difficulty in going from European size ice over to North American where the time and space easily shrinks away. So to do that at the NHL level as well is a lot to ask of, of a prospect. So. Getting your time and your reps down in the AHL is is certainly a good spot to be. And credit to Zarnik. I think he's done well with what they've asked him to do. And so as long as the Red Wings are winning, there's not really a need to to rush anything along. So it's the luxury. I mean, if Detroit was in a spot where they had like way fewer NHL-ready players, then this would be a very different conversation. Richard Clough is a new patron. Richard, welcome to the Dub Dub Club, and thank you so much for your support. Says, hey, guys, love the podcast. First time question. I'm getting married next year. Congratulations. Uh, good luck. Uh, so I was thinking since my groomsmen and I have all played hockey, I would get them and myself Red Wings jerseys with my last name in the year of the wedding. 24 on the back as a groomsman gift. Thoughts? I love it. The one thing I would change, put their names on the back of it so they can get use out of it going forward. I would vote for that as well. I mean, if, if you're already doing what you're doing, it's definitely not a bad, like, it's an incredibly generous gift idea. But if you have it in you to, yeah, I agree with that change. 
I always I focus on that with my groomsman gift is I want that, this to be useful for them. Wait, what did you get them? I forget. I got them these big leather uh, travel bags. Oh, that's nice. With uh, and it would they were uh, they had their initials um, on the one side, and then Ryan's face on yeah. the other side. <laughs> their initials engraved in it, and then they also had a dop kit, like a little like where you stick your toothbrush, all your toilet mm, tree, yes. toiletry bag, also with their initials. And then I got them some of my favorite hot sauce, which I wanted them to try. Yeah, that's sweet. Yeah. I, and if they already had a travel bag, then they can just use that for when they, like, on a little weekend or thing. But I thought that was pretty handy. What did you get? Yours. Well, I didn't have a wedding. So, oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. Well, that's stupid me. Yeah, I was stuck in Italy. It was terrible. <laughs> so I just spent that money on wine and expensive dinners. Did you do Grimsman gifts? I paid for their suits. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's, like, a very classic one, a very expensive one. So it's very generous of you. Yeah, I have a suit connection, so that helped. <laughs> you have a suit connection? Yeah. Oh, if you ever need it, let me know. Well, it's a bit late now. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I did mention it to you. Oh, buddy. I don't remember a single thing from the last <laughs> count. When I said good luck, Richard, it wasn't like mar- marriage is great. I love it. But the wedding planning process is, wow. I have The brain cells I lost, I'm probably better for it, but I certainly lost them. I'll tell you that much. Uh, Wallstead is a four-letter word, says not to highlight a negative because the season has been awesome, but does getting outshot the last four games signal anything for you? A lot of that uh, game score effect you know, when Calgary, they were up pretty big on Ottawa and Calgary for a good chunk of the game. And in those situations, the team trailing almost always outshoots the other teams. So I wouldn't read too much into it, given how a few of those games went. There are like some of the bigger margins definitely aren't great. I think they're reflective of times where Detroit seeded a lot of control on the ice, which is what we were talking about earlier. What I was saying, people were getting mad about because I said put the refereeing aside for a second, and everyone was like, no, don't put the refereeing aside, which fair, but also Detroit does need to control the play a little bit better. But also couple what Brad and I just said with no team is going to be perfect over the course of a season. So before the narrative used to be Detroit got outshot and then they lost. So is it concerning? Yeah, the same way it's concerning to any other team. Now it's Detroit gets up by two, three, four goals and takes the foot off the gas offensively and... Yeah, I don't. I'm concerned that they still have a bit too much of that prevent defense with a uh, a lead, but far less than a, I used to have on that subject. Jeremy Dahl says, and here I was wondering how many podcasts could we go without having to discuss a loss? Do you have any concerns with Huso? I'm not as confident with him just stopping anything uh, significant. At least the boys are scoring at a great clip, and I don't seem they don't seem to want to give up. I did enjoy everyone's effort last night. Yeah, he hasn't been great this year. He hasn't been bad. I don't think a lot of the goals have that have gone in on him were necessarily his fault. But there have definitely been a few that you wish he could have got. Yeah, it's funny because in the same game there would be that, but then he, for like some a hot minute in there, he would play great and keep them in it. So it's definitely not been Huso start that he had last season. I think he's been more than sufficient. Hasn't stolen anything for Detroit. Like, I could see a world where if he was lights out, Detroit would have taken that game against Seattle, no question. But you want to see him. I'm sure and I'm sure he wants to do it, but uh, play a little bit better. And last one here from Steve Fresh Cheeseback says, Hey there, fellas. I'm seeing a lot of Kubelik shade tossed out in the socials. The dude went out and scored us perhaps the quietest 20 goals in the league last season, along with 25 assists, and did so on the enduring rotating line carousel. Sure, he's no Debrinket, but he can't control where he's traded to and doesn't deserve all the hate he's getting. Did he see him slumped over on the Sens bench like a sad Charlie Brown during their loss to Detroit? I quietly hope he has a monster season and signs wherever he wants to next year. Stay fresh cheese bags. Yeah, whenever fans like make a traded player part of a narrative, I kind of feel bad. And I'm like, Kubelik didn't ask to be traded. I thought he, I think he's a good player. And I actually, I thought that was nice from Ottawa to get him as part of the package. It doesn't replace to brink it, but he's a good player who can score. Is yeah. there a tribute video? I forget. There must have been. Oh, we weren't privy to it. Well, no, for... but they haven't been in. They haven't been in Detroit. Yet. There will be. Oh yeah, you're right. People would have tagged me in that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> How, what did you feel about the Nedeljkovic tribute video? Yeah, like every other one. He, what the hell have you? What did we? What did we win while you were here? You know, there's not a, even a draft lottery. You know, there is a Jordan <laughs> Osterley tribute video. No. <laughs> what his highlights blocking a shot. Yeah, uh, that's about the uh, the status of that. <laughs> Please stop tagging me in those sorts of things. <laughs> Dan Hedin says, how is Hall leading the team with plus minus? Is he doing better than we thought? The simple answer is yes. Yeah, and he's more appropriately slotted in Detroit than he was in Toronto because he was on the top pair for stretches in Toronto. 
Uh, so he's not getting the tougher matchups here, and he is thriving. What I will say is, like, the season still has to shake out, so we'll see what the actual rotation ends up being, when is Edvinson going to get up, et cetera, et cetera. But Hall Sherratt has been not as what you would have thought, you know, at the end of last season or coming into this season. I think everybody who has an, who's a fan of an NHL team would say they live too close to Toronto when they get <laughs> a, tr- a Toronto player in yeah. a draft, or sorry, sign trade, however. All right, folks, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you are a new listener, welcome to the show. I would promise that we're not always this unhinged, but that might not be true. If you're a listener of old, thank you very much for tuning in. Again, there's two games before next episode. If you want to get one of the last 99 tickets to Winged Wheel Podcasting at the LCA, do not wait because we can't add any more after that. WingedWheelPodcast.com slash Red Wings or go to the link in the description. And to all of you who are support us on Patreon, thank you. And if you want to join the Dub Dub Club, Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. To all of our name level supporters on Patreon, you're the people who make this happen. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Ground Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Raymond's Missing Tooth, Icon, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham, Everybody Loves Raymond, Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donohue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt Esser, the Cheesebag Navy, Brian J. Bauer, Carl Brutina Nanaluski, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets and Anywhere But Tempe, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, D Town Westside, who's a brand new name level supporter. Thank you for joining the Dub Dub Club and welcome. Exquisite Teen Buble, Schwinslow, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hockey is Fun, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Marcus, Marlon Winchester, Matt K, Cannon Fodder of the Cheesebag Army, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, Never Go Full Kyle, R.A., Red 3, Ryan Hubbard, Ryan Vargas, who's a brand new name level supporter. Welcome, Ryan, and great name. Scott Martin, Brian Vasha, Scree and Lube, that's what I appreciate about you. Woman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, Adam Rose, Andrew Broderick, brand new name level supporter. Welcome, Andrew, to the Dub Dub Club. Axel Sandy Pelica, Big Cheese, Brad Simmons, Chuck Buffchest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, D Boss Snip Show, Frank Stanley, Ferk Houston, NHL to Portland Baby, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, Henrik Robert Deeks, James Laporte, James Pridemore, Jeremiah Dobo, JM Rhapsody, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Norris Sider, O Ophelia, Stephen, the Hodag, the Mexinadian, the Hat One Two Three, Tossing Sticks Like It's Three Hundred. Winging it in San Diego, ex formerly AA Ron, your second favorite patron. Thank you all so very much. We'll be back with you on Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.